Well, thank you all so much for joining us for the history of presidential libraries. In 1939, Franklin Roosevelt donated his papers to the federal government. He believed a nation must, quote, believe in the capacity of its own people so to learn from the past that they can gain in judgment in creating their own future, closed quote. Uh, this began a federal system of presidential libraries that currently has 15 institutions, 600 million pages of documents, 20 million photographs, seven, 750,000 museum objects, and more than 500 terabytes of electronic data. So this afternoon, we're going to explore the history of these libraries and how current issues have forced significant changes, beginning with the Barack Obama Presidential Library. And today's program is led by archivist Craig Wright, who's the supervisory archivist at the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library. So all 100 of us or so who are watching live and the many more that will watch the recording, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Craig for joining us here today. And Craig, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. And thanks everyone for uh, tuning in uh, and those who tune in later. Um, this is not a presidential library, but it's one of my favorite photographs. The White House is in the background and the West Wing is in the foreground. Uh, those of you who might have been to Washington may notice something unusual, the circular part that juts out from the West Wing was the Oval Office when Herbert Hoover was president. That was not wheelchair accessible. So when Franklin Roosevelt became president, they did a little modification and moved that to the corner uh, to the right side of that building. And that's where the Oval Office is today. And if you can actually see the little fenced in area on the right side, that's where they hung the laundry in Hoover's time. <laughs> Oops, let's see here. All right. So presidential records, uh, dividing it into four phases. Phase one was from George Washington until Herbert Hoover. In this case, during this period of time, the records were considered their personal property to do whatever they wanted to. Some presidents destroyed the records. Some, some presidents gave some of the records to Library of Congress. Some gave them to their states. They could do whatever they wanted to. And uh, uh, see, Herbert Hoover, who has a presidential library, uh, there's a picture of Stanford's campus there. Herbert Hoover was very, uh, he went to Stanford in the very first freshman class at Stanford and was on their board of directors for, I think, 50, more than 50 years. So starting in 1919, after his food relief efforts in Europe, he started moving and all of his papers he was accumulating over the course of his life to the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Um, and I just want to mention there, he, he started it off with $50,000 in 1919, which was 883000 plus in 2023. On the right-hand side there, you can see somebody working with the records, which would make sort of archivists shiver today because that's sort of not how uh, we modern archivists handle our records, uh, keeping them tied up in acidic uh, coverings like that. Phase two uh, basically goes from Franklin Roosevelt to Jimmy Carter. The records are still considered their personal property, uh, but they give them to the people of the United States under a deed of gift, uh, a donor agreement, as it were, uh, within uh, the NARA. Some of the things I say in here are sort of uh, the National Archives and Records Administration. I already used a shorthand, NARA. So the National Archives and Records Administration, who I work for, we have little phrases for things. And so deed of gift libraries is DOG libraries. And uh, the actual <clears throat> map here shows where all the 13 presidential libraries and uh, are. Um, Robert mentioned there's 15, and that would include then uh, Obama and Donald Trump. 
and they do not actually have a physical library like the rest. And I will certainly mention that a little bit more later on. But this just shows you uh, all over the country where the various presidential libraries are. Uh, for those of you who might be familiar with Michigan, where I grew up, there's two stars in there because Gerald Ford has his library in one city and his museum in a different city. So a little, every presidential library is unique and reflects in some, to some degree uh, the president uh, of which they serve. Uh, I mentioned the National Archives and Records Administration. Today, these federal uh, libraries are run by the National Archives. Uh, some of you may have been to Washington. You'll notice the top picture there is what we call Archives One. That's in downtown Washington, D.C. as the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and, and, and those types of things. Underneath it is what we call Archives Two in College Park, very close to the University of Maryland campus, where they have actually several million boxes of paper records. So it's it's rather huge. And I just wanted to point out here that NARA is not just presidential libraries. And again, I'm using 13 because I'm talking about physical libraries, not just the papers. Uh, which uh, And then they also control uh, regional repositories in 14 different cities. What they normally have there are records of various government agencies uh, rather than the presidential records. There are also presidential libraries that are not run by the National Archives. And I've listed a few here. Abraham Lincoln is actually, that's the photograph of the Lincoln Library in Springfield, Illinois, which is run by the state. Most of these are run by the state. I also mentioned Jefferson Davis, since he was actually sort of president over some of the states back uh, during the Civil War. Uh, he does have Although I think it might have been hit by a hurricane. Don't, don't quote me on that. But uh, anyway, there are other libraries. Most of them do not have the papers, although the Lincoln's been trying to collect as much as they can. Uh, most of them are really more the museums and uh, designed to help sort of tourism and the, and the places that they're located. So when it becomes a deed of gift library, what we see is a public and private collaboration. This often works smoothly, but sometimes causes tension. Uh, the, the, the key things to know are the president is raises the initial funds on his own. The initial building of the library, physical building, is not paid for by taxpayer dollars, but raised privately, uh, normally with the president. Uh, the archives side, which is the history of the papers and the, the part that's been gifted to the people of the United States is actually, uh, thank you all for taxpayers, you help pay my salary, but that is from public money and the museum and telling the stories, usually of the presidents and sometimes there's temporary exhibits about other topics, uh, that has to be raised from private money. So. Each of the libraries has a foundation, which raises money, uh, but we also have the National Archives. So it's depending sometimes how those two organizations are getting along, that it can impact on what's going on at the library. I have a picture. Hoover's not raising money for his library up there. Uh, that's actually him with Popeye, and they're raising money for uh, Finnish war relief in World War Two, when Russia invaded Finland, Hoover was trying to raise money to help feed the Finnish people. And then the bottom picture there is actually our reading room. Uh, we have a class of students there. We, we serve a number of educational purposes here. Uh, a lot of classes are interested in trying to integrate primary source material into their uh, classwork um, rather than just reading history books uh, and having someone tell them what history is. They get to experience it firsthand. So here I go to a little bit more presidential museums, uh, as I mentioned. So in some ways, I've, I've sort of alluded to the fact that sometimes relationships are smooth and sometimes a little rockier. A lot of this has to do with how do you tell the story of the presidents? And as you might expect, people who are raising money 
are normally want to tell the most positive story possible, and they want to shine up all the positive thing that th these people have done, which is fine. But sometimes they can maybe stretch it a little bit, or the, the National Archives staff normally tends to want a little more uh, balanced story. Um, and again, sometimes they're in complete agreement. So uh, I don't want anyone to sort of take away the idea that everyone's the same throughout their, their time of existence. Uh, the middle book there, The Last Campaign, <clears throat> again, sort of talks about these issues in that I worked, uh, Tony Anthony Clark uh, did research at all the presidential libraries. And uh, this is the book he came out with, which sort of talks about the nature of libraries. It's more focused on how they want to tell the stories. He loves the libraries. He loves the archivist. He loves doing research. But occasionally, Sometimes the director of the library has also been the president of the foundation. And that causes some people, some people consider that a conflict of interest. And, but it's happened only once so far in history. But Tony, Tony uh, thinks he's trying to warn about things or if, if libraries are do, overdoing things. Um, the other books there are really from archival literature that talk, that they talk about there's sometimes political pressure on how to tell these stories. And then there's also a whole group of archivists who are interested in telling stories of maybe the people who have not been talked about as much in history. So all of these things sort of blend together as uh, we try to work through and tell our stories. At the Hoover Library here, we're actually in the middle of raising $20 million to redo the, the Herbert Hoover permanent exhibit. Uh, we have a lot of really interesting ideas on ways to freshen it up and tell some points of view that maybe haven't been talked about before. Uh, so one of the examples of this friction, for example, the Hoover Library began in 19, it was opened in 1962 as part of the National Archives. And until 1992, they didn't mention the D word, the Great Depression. Uh, and so... Uh, certainly, since they did that, re sort of redid that story in 92, that's not something uh, we shy away from uh, anymore. And that's part of the story and it's part of American history. So, Roosevelt, here's really where the story starts. Roosevelt essentially breaks one tradition because George Washington chose not to run for a third term. Uh, he didn't want a king. He didn't want the president to become a king or have uh, too much power. And every successive president followed suit, well, until Franklin Roosevelt, who ran for a third term. It was not illegal. It was not in the Constitution. Uh, but quickly, uh, Congress uh, passed uh, legislation uh, that's no longer possible. You can only be president for two terms. But he begins... A new tradition, he gives his papers to the people of the United States and establishes the first presidential library uh, uh, out at his family property. And what happens then is presidents follow suit. It was not the law, but that was uh, what they took that and decided we're going to we're going to we're going to run with that. That's not a bad idea. We serve the people of the United States. They get to sort of know what we're doing. Uh, that was opened in 1941. Uh, Robert mentioned about his papers really were given, but it takes a while to actually build the building. And you can see some of the public who are visiting the library shortly after it was open. Next was the Harry Truman Library. He actually had a working office in there and worked out of the library for many years until he passed away. Um, and the picture on the, the right is actually Herbert Hoover and Harry Truman. They're not actually at the Truman Library. They're actually at the Hoover Library. Many of the libraries, because it's very popular with the public, have a recreation of the Oval Office. Um, so that's that's that. We, we don't currently have a, rep, a reproduction of the Oval Office, but when we opened, we did. And Herbert Hoover went to the opening 
of Truman's, they were active despite being almost polar opposites politically. This was back in the day when you still got along pretty well. And they were actually uh, became what I would consider friends. Uh, and anyway, Hoover went to the opening of the Truman and Truman came to the opening of the Hoover. The third presidential library to open was the Dwight Eisenhower and in Abilene, Kansas. Uh, you'll sort of notice there the museum opened up uh, much earlier than the library. And in the, the picture of the, of the site there in the bottom left, the building to the right is the museum and the building to the left is the, the library and archives. Uh, obviously, they, here's a picture of two uh, uh, former presidents cooking steaks in suits. I just find that amusing. I have a, a, sometimes people think I have an unusual sense of humor, but I've never really seen people cooking steaks on a grill in suits until I saw this picture. Uh, so the fourth presidential library to open was the Herbert Hoover presidential. As I mentioned before, his records were out in California. Initially, when this was open, there was no archives. It was really just going to be a museum. Herbert Hoover has a series of sort of some friction with Stanford. One of the things that is not currently the case, but the history of the libraries, many of these folks wanted to sort of be gatekeepers. So in this case, Herbert Hoover had his papers at Stanford, but they were not deeded over to Stanford. They were still his property to do with as he wanted. And over the decades that he had been there, Stanford had spent a fair amount of money to take care and catalog and take care of those records. And they basically said, hey, it's time to give a deed this over to us. And Herbert Hoover said, hey, can I appoint a director? And the idea of this director was, you know, basically they wanted to have the, the papers open to sympathetic public, not necessarily people who didn't like Herbert Hoover. And that doesn't necessarily go over that well in a, in a college and university setting. And so, Hoover's frustrated. He wants to have a, a sort of a gatekeeper on who gets access to his material. He talks to his friend, Harry Truman, says, hey, you're having the government make you a library. Do you think they'll let me appoint a director? And Harry Truman says, why, well, I'm pretty sure they will. Why not ask? The worst thing they can say is no. So Herbert Hoover asked the government uh, and they say, sure, you can appoint a director. So the short version of that is up until the 1980s, if you wanted to do research at a presidential library, you basically had to be considered a serious researcher. And so they might, you might send a letter saying, I'd like to do a project on the president and you know, foreign policy, whatever it happens to be. And they would might say, oh, there's been five books written about it. Have you read these books yet? And they might say no, and they would say, well, read those books and try again later. So uh, that is not the way things work anymore. Uh, like I said, it's various times during the 1980s that it started to shift over. This is public money. Uh, we are here to serve the public. We're not just here to restrict access to people who love our president. Uh, in our case, uh, and then the left there, the left picture with the uh, file cabinets, Herbert Hoover had a bunch of file cabinets. He lived in the Waldorf Astoria in New York City, and literally the semi showed up with all of the, the file cabinets locked like that. They weren't like in boxes, and so they unloaded numerous uh, file cabinets to get his records here, and they also sent other records from California that had been out at the Hoover Institution. And you can sort of see we have... They estimate roughly 8 million pages of documents, which if you laid them out in their boxes in a row, it's about 65, well, 6,500 cubic feet. Uh, that's not just a row, just not two-dimensional, it's three-dimensional. And it is a tiny percentage of the entire National Archives. We are by far the smallest, with the smallest staff and the smallest budget. Uh, but so our holdings are less than one tenth of one percent of all the National Archives holdings. Uh, it doesn't mean our researchers don't love us and we love our researchers, but 
we we are sort of the 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 younger brother on the block, if you want to put it that way. Um, next to open was the the LBJ Library down in Austin uh, in 1971. Uh, the picture on the bottom left is actually him signing uh, documents which establish our historic site here in West Branch, Iowa. So, and we have that pen that is in the picture there in our museum collection. Uh, there's an interesting story that when LBJ left office, uh, he came by West Branch here and toured our library. About, I think him and Lady Bird were here for about 20 minutes. And when he was done, and this sort of reflects again on how do we tell the story? So I'm slightly paraphrasing, but it's pretty close. LBJ said, when I got here, I didn't know a good goddamn thing about Herbert Hoover. And now I know he was a great man. And that's what I want my library to do for me. So uh, then we have Richard Nixon. Uh, this is not about the library. It's just that Richard Nixon, some of you may remember him or, or know of him in history. He was not interested in giving his papers to the people of the United States. Um, so actually, we have these stamps that says G GOP, Generation of Peace, when he ran in 1972, that was used to raise campaign money uh, for po people who didn't like him so much. Uh, uh, you can sort of see on the right-hand side there, that's an envelope that was made in California when the Nixon stamp was going to come out. So the people who didn't like him so much created this picture that you put his stamp in, which is not the most flattering. Um, so... His papers were kept in uh, in the National Archives as the courts worked through uh, what was going to happen with if they were his personal property. And that took over 30 years to make it through the courts. So in the meantime, his tapes, his uh, papers were all uh, archives too um, until uh, uh, that until they basically ruled that no, they, 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 it's okay. They belong to the people of the United States. <clears throat> ah, <laughs> okay. Next up, John F. Kennedy, Presidential Library and Museum, 1979. And part of the reason it took so long for the JFK Library to open was because for many years they were trying to find a site in downtown Boston. And that real estate is extremely expensive and eventually they realized that maybe we really shouldn't set it up downtown and uh it's a, a beautiful building that had overlooks uh uh the bay uh, some of the researchers have been out here that have also been to jfk said that sometimes it's hard with the wonderful scenic view they have it's hard for them to focus on their research because they uh, just love the situation and then the bottom right there is uh picture of uh, JFK and Herbert Hoover. When I first got here 20 years ago, I was a little surprised by this. And then I realized, so Herbert Hoover was a non-interventionalist and not really supporting entering World War II until obviously the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. That changed everyone's minds. And Joseph Kennedy, John Kennedy's father, was also a non-interventionalist. And Herbert Hoover and Joseph Kennedy, I think, were quite well acquainted. We have a lot of correspondence between those two men, which I sort of explain why, why, why Jack might be interested and in, in quite friendly towards Herbert Hoover since his father was as well. Next up, Gerald Ford, our only non-elected president. Uh, also, uh, he, I mentioned earlier, he's sort of a... He is a moderate who likes to try to make everyone happy. So uh, he went to the University of Michigan. So his library is at the top picture there is in Ann Arbor, where I went to school. I learned to be an archivist right next door at, at a place called the Bentley Historical Library. So I'm familiar with the, the Ford Library. Uh, and then the really beautiful building there on the bottom is in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And the museum is really uh a beautiful wonder, uh, I think. In, anyway, so he, you know, he lived he lived in the Grand Rapids area, and he went to school at Michigan. And both of them wanted his library, so he split them into two, which is 
maybe not the best thing if you put your taxpayer hat on, but that's how it is. Uh, on the bottom left there, he's with um, Hoover's son, uh, Alan, who's presenting Ford with a, a book, and they're sharing, obviously, a, a, a nice moment. Um, uh, Gerald Ford actually also nominated Hoover to win the Nobel Prize. Uh, unfortunately, Hoover uh, passed away before they had voted, and they don't uh, they don't actually award them to people who passed away. So that was the closest Hoover came. I think he was nominated four times, and that one seemed like it might get through, but he passed away. Um, Next up, the Jimmy Carter Library uh, opens in 1986 down in Atlanta. Again, a beautiful, a beautiful site. Um, and here's a case: uh, Jimmy Carter, as many of you might know, had some very strong interest in his post presidency, uh, building houses and doing all kinds of things. So he did; he does have a presidential library, but he really was not. Yeah, that was not, he had other things he enjoyed more. So he didn't spend a lot of attention or time there. Um, and that's fine. Each, each of these folks get to follow their heart's pursuit. And, and Jimmy Carter has some really, uh, I think, wonderful pursuits for the public good. Uh, I think Herbert Hoover had a long uh, post-presidential career in public service. And I think uh, him and Jimmy Carter share that act uh, where they, uh, maybe they're not president anymore, but they're trying to stay active and do good works for people. Uh, so phase three, I mentioned earlier, uh, Richard Nixon was not interested in donating his papers to the people of the United States. Um, so even though it took 30 years for the courts, Congress moves to act and they say, no, 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 no. These are not your personal property they belong to the people of the United States. That legislation passes during Carter's administration, but it can't be made retroactive. So Ronald Reagan's library is the first library that this is the, what they call the Presidential Records Act. Within the NARA, we call it the PRA libraries as opposed to the DOG libraries. Um, and that goes up through uh, George W. Bush, again, within NARA, we call them Bush 41 and Bush 43 because that's the number of their presidency. Um, got George W. on the right there with Obama. Um, a little shot, I think, from the Reagan there. Um, anyway, having said that, it might be people might be interested to know that it's only the president whose papers are considered belonging to the people of the United States. Not the vice president, not the senators, not members of Congress. All of those folks, it's still considered their personal property to do with what they want. So, Ronald Reagan, uh, this is old. Now, he opened in 1991. Um, you'll notice from this, their website now matches all, I think, pretty much all the libraries that to go to their website say, Presidential Library and Museum. But as I mentioned, sometimes there's these, there's the foundation in the library. And when you, for many, for the first quite a few years, if you went to the Reagan website, it says the Presidential Foundation and Library. And that's surprising as a person who could raise all kinds of money. Uh, the foundation certainly, I think, had was was dominant for quite a bit of time. Uh, uh, it's, a, again, a beautiful site, as you can see up at the top there. Uh, there's a peak in the stack. So on the bottom right, this is how our, although we don't have as many boxes as they do there, but this is how the raw papers of history are stored in these boxes and on shelves in the climate-controlled room so they will last as long as possible. Contrast that with the earlier picture with the guy and all the stuff tied up together in, in, in the Cidic wrappers. Uh, you can see that's you can see we we've, we've come a little ways for taking care of our history than we did uh, on the left there. That's Iowa Senator uh, Burke Hickenlooper. Uh, I was trying to find a photo. I tried to find photos of the presidents with within our collections. And 
got, obviously, we have the Hickenlooper papers here. We have 300 people's papers here that are, are not named Herbert Hoover. And other, the other libraries as well. I keep, today, I'm just really talking about presidential records, but uh, we all have a variety of other historical materials beyond just uh, our presidents. Uh, another interesting thing, I think, about the Reagan Library is, so a lot of us are in one building. So if the government shuts down, we are required to close. I am not allowed to come on the site here. Essentially, our facilities manager can come in, but the other staff is not allowed to do any work whatsoever. Um, but our spaces are often a mixture. Uh, a lot of the libraries, we do not have like a cafeteria, but some of the other libraries have a place where you can get things to eat. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the museums are run by private money. So they're run, so, you know, technically the foundation, they can be open there. Uh, and so the Reagan library, and I don't know if they did this. I'm curious now. I'm asking myself questions. Apologies. Uh, the, the, the Reagan, the library was closed during government shutdowns, but the museum was open. And also uh, the food uh, was open. And here we live in a small, we're in a small Iowa town. And when the government shut down, our local eating establishments business went down by uh, like two thirds. Uh, so they, there's a ripple effect when, when the government shuts down and, and uh, we have to stay home. There's, uh, there's a number of businesses that support us that also suffer uh, when the government shuts down. Uh, George Bush or H.W. Bush Presidential Library. I like baseball. Hoover loved baseball. When uh, George was at Yale, he, they actually uh, Babe Ruth gave some papers to Yale, and so here's a, a publicity shot where Babe Ruth is giving uh, uh, Bush uh, some of his stuff as to mark the occasion. So that's '97. Uh, Clinton. Uh, um, Clinton. Uh, uh, Actually, it's been given a lot of credit for revitalizing that area of Little Rock. It has more glass than our entire square footage here, which I think is uh, sometimes a headache for the maintenance people. Uh, uh, Clinton, unlike Carter, I mentioned Carter was not that you know not that engaged with his library. Clinton, uh, one of our former staff people here, became the museum person over at the Clinton and. Uh, he would occasionally like to sit down and in their replica of, of the Oval Office. And she said that when they go in there the next day, he often had moved things around. And so <laughs> they were trying to put them back where, you know, it's where they where they thought they should be uh, for their display purposes. <laughs> um, and the Nixon Library, this is no longer the the uh, color scheme. Uh but it had been established as a private library. Remember, the papers were in uh, Archives 2, and the court was trying to decide what to do with the papers. Uh, the Nixon um, fans uh, established a library. Obviously, didn't have the papers. But in 2007, it actually joined uh, the National Archives, and uh, the, the National Archives has a lot to do with it. Again, beautiful beautiful Yorba Linda, California. Uh, and also, we didn't mention the D word here for 30 years. Uh, they didn't really talk about Watergate at the Nixon until it became part of the, there was a small exhibit about the size of the door that was around a corner. Um, and so you'd have, I think the people told me if you really didn't even notice it was there unless you had to go to the restroom and you turned the corner to go to the restroom and there was a little piece on, on the water gate, but that is no longer the case. Uh, also that picture of Richard Nixon and Elvis is the most reproduced image of anything within the National Archives. Uh, so Elvis is still king and Maybe Nixon is riding his coattails there. I don't know. Uh, George W. Bush Library is the uh, first library. We'll get into this as we get a little further. That has more digital information than paper. 
And so, as I'll be talking a little bit more, there's a shift here uh, as we're in the modern age and we're moved to digital information and much less paper is being generated. Uh, this is a tipping point where there's more digital than paper. Uh, I, uh, we have a, a minor connection here. When we are 10 miles away from the University of Iowa. One of our interns who then liked it so much, he then volunteered for us. Uh, he then went to work at the Gerald Ford Library as, a, as an archives technician, took some classes, and then was hired as a full archivist at the George W. Bush Library. And then he was the first archivist hired for the Obama Library, which we'll get into in a second here. So Obama begins phase four. I've alluded to earlier, yes, the, the, the National Archives considers that we have 15 presidential libraries, and, I, and I'm talking about 13 physical brick and mortar structures. Uh, currently, the Obama materials are in a warehouse in the Chicago area where uh, NARA folks are busy. Well, and something else to know about presidential records is the first thing that you need to do is the archivists have to go through and determine which materials can be open to the public. By law, I believe it's supposed to be 16 years. I might be wrong. It might be 12 or 16. Theoretically, all the papers are supposed to be open to the public. Unfortunately, when there's millions and millions of pages that need to be reviewed, it's not physically possible to review every page in that amount of time. And I, uh, con the, there's occasionally talk in, in, in Congress about maybe we can relax that rule a little bit to try to get more pa more papers open to the public uh, more quickly. Um, on the left there, you sort of see a model of the Obama presidential site that will be in Chicago area, in Chicago, south side of Chicago. It's in Chicago. It's not Chicago area. That's where the, uh, the papers are currently. Um, Donald Trump's, now I don't believe he's interested in a library, and I'm going to go into that in a second, but his papers are like the Richard Nixon papers. They are in uh, Archives 2 in College Park. Uh, and this is the beginning of this time of transition. In my opinion, we are not going to have presidential libraries uh, like I've been talking about for the, most of the talk here. Um, I, we don't. I don't know what they're going to decide to do, but I. Then there's two reasons. Number one, money. So, currently, the presidential libraries that exist are supposed to have an endowment that covers twenty percent of our annual operating expenses. Uh, I think most of us are pretty close. I think some of them are a little short of that, but I mean that was sort of the the rule of thumb. Under the congressional law enacted quite a while ago, Obama, and not because it was Obama, because this is long before Obama was president, it was supposed to move up to 40% of your annual operating expenses. And that's it's getting to be pretty significant endowment. Um, and Congress before Obama's library was uh, really even being discussed in detail. Congress up to that to 60%. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that are just going to sit in the bank as an endowment. And I don't believe personally, it's just as it's my personal opinion, not that of the government or the National Archives. I don't see a foundation finding that a good deal. We might find out with uh, Biden whenever he leaves office, if he decides he wants to do a library, uh, if they decide that it's worth the effort to have that substantial endowment, that is, you know, I think it's almost bordering on costing more than the darn building. And that's, that's already as it has to be raised publicly. It's not, it's not your tax dollars to create these places. Um, the other element that I think is a significant impact in this transition is, as I alluded to earlier, almost all of the information is digital. So 
I mentioned earlier that the, the tipping point came during the George W. Bush administration. I don't remember how many terabytes. I think there was actually a ter ter more than a terabyte just of the doggy cam. If you remember, some of you might remember, they had a little camera on one of their dogs, and you could see him running around the, the White House and stuff. Uh, anyhow, so Obama was going to have a presidential library, and like I mentioned, one of our staff, former um, interns was hired as the first archivist for the Obama Library. And I believe at, at one point, we had, NARA had hired about 16 people. And we'd gone through the transition because originally the papers, the records of these folks are all out east. And so um, our person, whose name was Christian, he actually was in Texas, obviously, at the W Library, goes to Washington. He helps move all the materials to Chicago. And one Friday afternoon, late in the day, the Obama Foundation says, you know what, we're not actually going to do a library. We're going to instead pay to digitize all the remaining materials. Uh, that was what they said. And everything sort of went into flux. And so... Uh, Christian, not knowing about how viable his future is, he's actually uh, established another different job uh, in Washington, having to deal with uh, classified records and such. So he's landed on his feet. Uh, we still don't know exactly what they were going to do with the Obama uh, materials. Are they going to add it to a federal building in Chicago? There's many options. Um, anyway, one of the things they were saying is that 95% of those records are digital, which leaves 5% that's paper. Well, I ran the numbers. Our entire collection is like 6,500 cubic feet, if you remember. 5% of Obama is still 25,000 cubic feet of paper. So what, four times bigger than our entire holdings in our stacks? Uh, that's, a lot, that's a lot of paper. And... In the meantime, it's obvious the Obama Foundation is not going to pay to have anything digitized. It's all on the National Archives to make it happen. So they've been working on it. Um, and then uh, the Trump, I mentioned they the National Archives calls it a library, even though it's at Archives 2, which is fine. I just want to make it clear about the definitions being used. Um, so that is the first president who will have less paper than Herbert Hoover. So, you know, one of the options is uh, keep the stuff out east. Uh, another option might be to have, I, I, I suspect there will still be a lot of interest in creating a museum somewhere. I just don't think that the papers are going to reside there. Uh, one solution that makes sense to me, but I'm very low on the totem pole, so uh, no one's listening, but here's my idea is that Let's set up like a presidential records center, preferably, I think, somewhere in the Midwest at a hub that's a lot cheaper than Washington, D.C., and then all successive presidents, since they're generating so little paper, all of their stuff can go there, and there's an easy-to-access place uh, for researchers who might need to look at uh, the original papers that remain. There's treaties, there's a number of categories of material that we are still going to always have paper moving forward. Um, but the vast majority of it is going to be digital. Um, and I can go way deep into tech weeds, and I don't need to bore everyone with that. <laughs> I basically, my job here, 60% is digitizing paper material and getting it to researchers all around the world. Uh, or the other side of Iowa who can't make it here regardless. Um, so uh, I think got uh, some time for questions here. Uh, I'm gonna mention my, uh, one of my favorite photographs on the left there is Betty Ford, who was a trained dancer. And this is actually on her last day in the White House. The family had hired a photographer to take candid shots of the family while they were in the White House. And she's touring around the White House with the photographer. And she says, I always wanted to dance on the, the cabinet table where the cabinet meets. And the photographer said, uh, Betty, I think this is your last chance. So she kicked off her shoes and got up and did a dance on the table there. And so I, I just love that 
photograph. Uh, the other one that I enjoy is on the right hand side there that really has to do with prohibition, which is nothing else in my talk. But I love this idea Hoover or saloon. What would Jesus do? And you have a, a, a little girl there, I think, trying to evoke sympathy for maybe you guys shouldn't be drinking. <laughs> anyway, any questions? Uh, All right. So, folks, let's give Craig a big virtual round of applause. And as he said, get your questions into the Q&A, your comments into the chat. Uh, we have at least 11 minutes here to go. Uh, Nancy says, Nancy is going right forward, right away. OK, Nancy asks, are classified documents held in these libraries? And what will happen to Trump's and Biden's and Pence's classified documents when the courts are finished with them? All right. Well, not a surprising question, considering all the news that's going on today. So the answer is an archival. Uh, I always call it, say my archival answer is it depends. So number one, most uh, only five of the presidential libraries still have classified materials on site. We actually uh, have never I don't know if we've ever really had them here. There are some folders, most of our classified material, maybe some of you have seen the, the movie Oppenheimer. Uh, there's a their character in there, Louis Strauss, who actually, we have his papers here. And since he ran the Atomic Energy Commission for, for quite some time, there are a number of folders of classified materials from his, uh, his papers. Those have always really resided in Washington. Our entire volume of classified records is probably if you remember those little boxes i showed you in the in the stacks maybe two of those boxes and they are currently held in archives too and um, we do not have the capacity to declassify them the office of origin whoever created that document reviews it and decides uh whether or not to uh, declassify now one of the cost-saving measures that the National Archives thought might be interesting because ha we have a, there's a lot of special extra security <clears throat> and rooms, costly stuff that it takes to keep those classified materials as one might expect. We want to make it extremely hard. Only the people we want to are. Hey, I used to have top secret security clearance. It sort of waned because I don't need it anymore um, in case we ran across stuff. Anyway. So they call it a, a they call it a skiff, but it's a special, different place you store the papers to, to where the security is super tight, and having that at multiple places costs lots of money. So one of NARA's cost saving measures is they wanted all the libraries that still had classified materials, excuse me to send them to DC where they could be more cost effective. We can have it all in one giant fancy place, which they have several, excuse me, several of them at archives too. So, um, and that process had begun. I don't remember. There were a number of libraries that already transported all of their classified materials to A2. And then there were five left when COVID hit. So that stopped that process. We are, there are Maybe you guys have heard that the uh, that budget hasn't been passed yet. It helps when the budget's passed so we can actually move forward with some of our projects, but don't consider that sour grapes. Now, to your other point is there's a whole process for where uh, these classified materials are stored and how they're cared for. So I believe, uh, well, both with Biden and Trump, as these materials are returned, they've gone to into the system how they're supposed to be properly cared for. I hope that answers uh, most of what she was ho hoping to hear. If not, ask me additional questions. Uh, I think so. Uh, so Tish asks, which uh, of the presidential libraries and museums are the most visited? I would say most recently it's been uh, the Bush 43, the George W. Bush is the newest. Normally it's the newer ones. And then there's actually two different elements to this question. So there's visitation for the museum to come see the exhibits 
And then there's visitation for our research rooms where people are accessing materials to do history or National History Day projects for the kids or for whatever purpose. Um, so normally what's going to happen is visitation is the highest at the most recent place because it's the newest. I'm going to put a caveat in there because it fluctuates. So when a library does a major renovation, for example, when our little $20 million project is done and they've redone all of the exhibits on Herbert Hoover, incorporating Lou Henry Hoover into it more and, and other things, and we will see a rather large spike in a, in visitation here when that happens. For Usually that happens for a couple of years and then it plateaus out at a new level. Having said that, we're still the smallest. So although I expect our attendance to go up significantly, it's still not going to probably hit uh, the level of uh, some of the other libraries. And the other thing that's beneficial is if you're in a large urban area, Obviously, it's easier for many, many people to get there. Uh, so, but I I think generally speaking, I'm not really too far off if I say probably overall, the W is the, is the most visited for museum visitation. Uh, very little of the records are open yet. So I'd have to actually try to do a little calculation, which I won't do right now, where you sort of see who's Who's the who's the president that's recently had a lot of those records opened up to the public? Because uh, most of the holdings of the newer libraries are not open to the public until, like I mentioned earlier, until every single page and every single page on a digital document are reviewed for the nine different ways that it might be uh, restricted for a certain time period. So, uh, Nancy asks, who pays for the endowment? Uh, the endowments are supposed to be set up by the foundations, which is why I suspect that found whatever foundation for any president is going to be much more hesitant to make a brick and mortar place when they have to raise all that extra money. Christine asks, are the president's descendants major contributors to the libraries and museums? I'm going to go back to my favorite archival answer. It depends. <laughs> so many years, uh, the JFK, for example, I believe uh, the daughter was on their board, uh, which was, and also a number of Fortune 500 companies. So they had uh, a lot of access to a lot of funds. You go back to the older ones like Hoover and Roosevelt. Uh, there's we we have fam, Hoover family that's still active in supporting uh, the library, but not so much financially. They're on our foundation board and they're involved in the decisions for the new exhibit. Um, and actually, it's uh, Margaret Hoover who hosts Firing Line is, is on that, and her cousin uh, Margaret uh, no no uh, Leslie Hoover Laubel. Uh, is also uh, active on the board and Alan Hoover III. So we have a number of Hoover family members who are interested and support us in various ways, uh, not not so much financially. When, when I first got here, um, Alan, uh, uh, the, Herbert Hoover III, so the family always called the president uh, Bert, and that's what I have often refer to him as his his first son was Herbert Hoover Jr. was always referred to by the family as Herbert. And then his first male grandson was known as Herbert Hoover the third. He told me they ran out of nicknames for Herbert, so they called him Pete after the family cat. And he was a delightful gentleman. He uh I mean he stopped with his wife and sat down and answered questions from third graders for 25 minutes in our lobby. And uh he he was really, and the part of the reason I bring him up is he's the last per family member that I know is active in helping us raise money for our activities here. He was really good uh, about saying, hey, I'm willing to donate 50000 if the foundation board, I'll match what the foundation board raises. So that, when you have that kind of incentive, people go out and, and shake the trees a little bit harder, right? So 
when I got here 20 years ago, he was he was still active and he he certainly uh, uh, I thought they had some financial contributions to our work here and the family's still active. Um, I think most of the places the family is active. But every place, it's different on how they are are interacting with the libraries. Uh, last question is going to go to Tom, who asks, are all the email and text messages archived? And what about social media posts? Yes, there's uh, the newer, the, the newer, uh, the newer uh, presidents who have a lot of that stuff. All of that is part of the digital information that I went. Now, here's where the younger, the younger uh, archivists who are coming in the profession, most of them are being trained at how to do this. There's a whole number of systems that you can create to try to make. There's multiple copies that are saved, and things are checked every day to see if there's any kind of file corruption. I mean, again, I can go into way too much detail, but yes. Um, one of the things I found interesting is I know some folks were unhappy. There was a period of time, I think, when Donald Trump got rid of his Twitter account or whatever, and people were concerned that uh, that was all lost. But no, it was already being saved. So even though you wouldn't be able to get at the public, that digital information remains and will uh, be, ac be accessible at some point in the future. Uh, another technology issue See, librarians and archivists are early adapters of new technology. Everyone thinks we're sort of dusty old fogies who, who are not willing to come into the modern age. And that was exemplified when Obama came into office. And we are required by law, or the, certainly the PRA libraries, to document everything that they're doing as presidents. And I believe he had a BlackBerry. And basically, the National Archives said, no, you can't use the BlackBerry until you create a system that saves everything you're doing. The way it was reported in the press is, oh, these Luddite archivists aren't supporting the use of the Blackberries. Like, no, we are. <laughs> we just want everything to still leave a trail so history, history, historians will be able to access it. So, uh, yes, uh, uh, the databases, the emails. Uh, now, Again, there, again, I can go way deep in the weeds, but there are certain things you can put on your phone that will try to delete everything right after it's done. So it's a constant. You meet with the president's staff. You make them aware of the laws. Uh, hopefully they will comply. If you suspect they aren't, you try to have uh, ways to make sure that stuff's being saved. So I guess I can't say 100 percent it's being saved, but. The vast majority of it is, and, and gosh knows, I think most of the staffs of the presidents all cooperate and are happy to share the, that information. So I think with that, Craig, a few comments. Uh, Sherry and Suzanne, thank you. Jenna says, fantastic presentation. Judy says, great presentation and information. Joyce says, thank you, Craig, for a wonderful presentation. You explained everything so well. And Ellen says, Craig was really awesome. I hope he will come back again. Well, I have some bad news for Ellen and some good news for Craig, because <laughs> Craig, uh, right before we got on here, uh, Craig told me that he is coming up on his retirement. So uh, congratulations, Craig, on your upcoming retirement. Uh, thank you so much for uh, not only today's webinar, but our webinar last year as well. Uh, both were very successful and uh um yeah I, I, we're gonna we're gonna miss you craig we barely knew you but we're gonna miss you a lot any uh well, any maybe there's advice? a way to actually still do it even though i won't be the oh. supervisory archivist anymore so okay that's good that's to one know. of the things i might love to do in retirement is still share the his stories of history so <laughs> well craig when you uh, send me your uh, personal email or whatever email you're going to be using when you retire and uh we can connect. So I will uh, anyway, do that. Sir. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you all so, so much uh, for yes, those watching everyone. live. Yes, Craig, excellent job. For those watching live, look for an email from me later today with a link to the recording, a link to a feedback survey and information about some other upcoming programs. So thank you all so, so much. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks again. Bye, everyone.